God's people said, Amen. Amen. What a great, man, that was just awesome. I, I was praying, I told Mark, I woke up last night in the middle of the night, I said, I, red letters, I'll hear it. And I went back to sleep, I was good with it. Faith, you see, I had faith. <laughs> there it is. You guys always, I'm not sure if it's bearded moose or bearded lady, I'm not saying bearded lady, so... Uh, <laughs> Bearded, bearded moose, also known as bearded lady right now. So, it, man, it's always good to be with you guys. Seldom is it that you come across a people and a pastor that have such a heart's desire and cry for revival. It's very rare in the culture in which we live. We are in a culture tonight that is in desperate need of a revival. And when I say that, I mean to the people of God. We need to see revival. We need to see the wind of revival sweep on the church of the living God once again. And here's what you know. When God's people are revived, lost people will get saved. That's what you know. Now understand, revival and evangelism are two different things. That is two different events, totally separate, one from the other. But you will never find a revival on the book of history that did not have as its product mass evangelism to follow. So we know that when God's people experience the touch of God, then lost people experience the grace of God. So we recognize that's the great need for the hour. The Bible says, if my people who are called by my name, that means God's people. We understand that is a mandate to the church. So we understand tonight that revival comes on the requirements of God. And the, it's clear in Psalm 85, 6, when the Bible says, Wilt thou not revive us again, that we may rejoice in thee? That is a clear indicator that revival is a sovereign act of a holy God. That means he brings it when people meet that requirement in the moment and in his time. And I just believe that's here, and I believe it's now. And I believe we've seen it here, and I'm not relying on what I saw a year ago because I believe that he, listen, his mercies are new every day and every morning. And I believe he wants to do tonight, this week, something he's never done before. So I would just say again, seldom do you come across a people that have a heart's cry for revival. But I want to say this, seldom do you come across a pastor that has that heart as well. And you have that pastor tonight. And I want to tell you, I love this man like a brother. And I thank God for his heart, for his ministry, and for the mission that he is carrying out right here in this community. And I want to tell you, I don't know another preacher in the convention tonight. I don't know another preacher in this state, region, or elsewhere that has a heart's cry for revival like Greg Carter. And I'm telling you, I see all kinds every day of the week. I know what they look like. And I'm telling you tonight, you've got a wonderful pastor and family. Listen, God is placed here for this moment to lead you in things that will not just be for this week or this month or this year. It'll be things that your children and grandchildren will look back and say, God met us right there. This will be a memorial stone in your life like, like nothing else that could have happened. And it will be clear and it will be simple that God met us right here. That's why we're here. That's why we've come and I'm thankful to be back. I could not wait to get here. I couldn't hardly get through this morning trying to get here tonight. But here we are, and I'm looking forward to it. And I trust you've come expecting God to do something. You understand tonight, we don't have any more than we have because we don't expect any more than we expect. We need to begin to expect God to move in our midst once again. And I'm telling you, when you meet that requirement and that expectancy level, you will see him do something that you've never seen him do. I want to ask you a question. Got any rivers you think are uncrossable? Got any mountains you cannot tunnel through? God specializes in things thought impossible. He'll do for you what no other power can do. That's the power of God tonight. Amen? Take your Bible and be finding 2 Kings chapter number 2. 2 Kings chapter 2, where tonight I want to preach a message that if I had but one message left, if I had but one more opportunity to preach and to share a message with God's people, I believe this is the message of not only this night, but I believe it's the message of this hour. I believe it's the message of this time in which we're living. I believe if there's one question that's asked in Scripture that ought to be asked again right now, it is found right here in our text. So it's with that tonight from 2 Kings chapter 2 that I want to preach on this subject. Where is the Lord God of Elijah? Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And if you're able tonight, I'll ask you to stand for the reading of the infallible, inerrant, inspired, invincible 
most perfect and powerful word of the living God. 2 Kings chapter 2, and let's look in verse number 14. The Bible says, And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him. Now you know the backdrop of this story tonight. Elijah and Elisha are walking along, and Elijah is fixing to go to the airport of heaven and meet the heavenly horsemen. And he's fixing to be carried up away from Elisha, the prophet that was called for that moment. And as the two men walked together, they crossed across the Jordan River on dry land. And now, as Elisha would ask Elijah one of the most important questions of his ministry and probably of his lifetime, transcending to where we are right now tonight. When Elijah asked him he said what is it that I can do for you and Elisha just simply asked back he said give me a double portion give me a double portion and understand by asking that one question alone here is what he said when Elijah the prophet came down and he met him there plowing with the oxen the Bible tells us that Elijah threw that mantle upon him and he said come and go with me the question that Elisha asked back was this he said let me go back and let me see my family he said what is this that I've done to you. He said, you come with me now. And you remember what he did? He took his animal and he killed it. He took the animal and he literally boiled the flesh with the instrument, the ox yoke and the plow itself, making the fire and building it to cook the animal upon it. You say, what does that mean to us tonight? It means this. In the life of Elisha, every bridge was burned behind him. He says, I'm not going back. I'm going forward in the power of God. Well, now that moment would come where his time would literally be manifest and he asked this question what is it that I can do for you and he said oh my Lord give me a double portion of your spirit and then he said these words he said if you see me when I go away if you're watching when I go up he said, there, then you will know that the double portion will be given to you. And now, as the Bible says, Elijah is taken up, and Elisha saw him go and then would see him no more. The Bible says he would now come. And at verse 13 says, he took up the mantle that fell from him, and he literally went back and stood by the same bank of the Jordan River. And notice what he says now in verse 14. He took that mantle, and he smote the water. And here's what he said. Where is the Lord God? of Elijah. Oh, tonight, church, that's the question that needs to be asked. That's the question that ought to land on the lips and on the hearts and on the doorsteps of the local church. We have never seen a more powerless, fruitless generation than the one we are living in tonight that will require something greater than man's machinery, man's money, man's method. It'll take something greater than that, and it's only found in the hand and the heart by the provision and the extension of Almighty God. I'd ask the question tonight. Where is the Lord God of Elijah? The Bible says now in this text, he took that man on. Watch what he did. Look in verse 14. He smote the water and look what it says. They parted hither, thither, and then Elisha went over now for the second time. And then notice what verse 15 says. It says that when the sons of the prophets, uh, the seminary boys, say amen right there. Here's what they said. They looked at him in view of Jericho and they saw him. And look what it says. They said, the spirit of Elijah doth rest on Elisha. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, Lord, do tonight what I cannot do. Lord, I pray that you'll sweep in this place. Father, and just in a mighty way and in a powerful way and we would see your face once again. Lord, let us cry out and crave for your power tonight. Lord, without it, we're dead in the water. Lord, without it, we're nothing more than just mechanized social organizations. But God, let it be more than that. Let it be a place where the seasoned power of God is sensed, Lord, and known by all who not only just come in her doors, but everyone who just drives by will recognize that the power of God is real and alive and available here that souls can be saved and lives can be changed and there's a power here that the world knows nothing about. So God, do in our midst as we begin this meeting tonight, Lord, as we begin this week together, Lord, I pray that it would start right here, that we as a church would cry out, where is the Lord God of Elijah tonight? Where is the Lord God of Elijah in our personal lives? Where is the Lord God of Elijah in our public life? Where is the Lord God of Elijah in our professional lives. God, I ask now that you would sit down in this place and do something that only you can do. Lord, we thank you. And Father, I thank you for your word. 
I thank you for your power. I thank you most of all for your grace, your blood, your mercy, Lord, that is free to anyone who will call upon your name. And God, I pray if there are those who have come to church tonight but have never come to Christ, I pray that today would be the day of salvation. Oh, why not tonight, Lord? Do a great work right here in our midst. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Down through the scriptures, many questions have been asked that would define the moment in which they are asked. Down through the word of God. As you look from Genesis all the way through the Old Testament, as you open up the New Testament down to its very last book, you will find questions that are asked. And when those questions are asked, they define a particular moment in which they are asked. Well, I believe the question before us tonight defines the moment in which we live. I believe the question before us tonight defines the very situation and circumstance in which we are experiencing right now. You recognize tonight we are living in perilous times. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1, this know also in the last days perilous times will come. And then there are 19 typifying signs and factors that will sum up the age in which we are living. Things like men will be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. They'll have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. They will have all of these things said about them. I would submit to you tonight, you don't have to look very far to understand we are living in a culture that mirrors that. But when you hear the words of Jesus from the Mount of Olives as he is there in that great discourse, he said two very particular times would be brought back to the time right before he would come back. He said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. Jesus was simply saying, Saying that there was a day on the book of history. It's found in Genesis chapter 6. And the Bible tells us that man had gotten so wicked in heart, mind, and deed that he was sorry that he made man on the earth. He brought a flood that would destroy mankind. But he did not do so without making a way, an ark, an old-fashioned ark, which is a mirror of an old-fashioned cross where Jesus Christ would die for a way of escape for you and for me. But Jesus said, as it was in those days, you say, well, preacher, what do those days look like? Well, the Bible says they were eating, drinking, and giving in marriage right up into the day Noah went into the ark. What that means to us tonight, Walkerville, is this. Men were living, existing as if God did not exist. That's how men lived then. That's how men are living tonight. So we understand the days of Noah are typified by a very cold and indifferent and apathetic generation. But I want to go a step further tonight. I believe we've gone past the days of Noah, but I believe we're living in the other day that Jesus talked about where he says not only what would it be as it was in the days of Noah, but he also said as it was in the days of Lot. Now you understand, as you think about the days of Lot, Lot was a man who was Abraham's nephew who lived down in a place called Sodom and Gomorrah. You understand tonight that Sodom and Gomorrah is the two cities that God burned to the ground for her sin. You understand that they were cities that were sexually immoral. They were absolutely perverted and debased in every single way, shape, and form. That is the generation that you and I are living in right now. Never have we seen a more immoral generation than the generation you and I are living in right now. I want to just go on record and get this out of the way. You understand tonight that we are debating in the halls of government what the Word of God has already settled. We are debating things that God's Word has settled and finished long ago. And we, in our own wisdom, professing ourselves wise, are becoming fools by the moment. And what we are doing, not only in the church, but out of the church, is we are rejecting and neglecting not only the Word of God, but the power of God in our life. And until we come back in humility, on our knees, with our necks bent low, crying out, for the only one who can meet us in this moment. We're only going to see what we're seeing and we're not going to get any more than we're getting. But I'd say tonight, if we cry out to God, He'll do a great work. I'm going to show you that in just a moment right here in the Scripture. But I want you to understand tonight, when this question was asked, Elisha was facing an apostate generation. He was facing a nation that was wholly given to idolatry and the things of the world. So as he cried out for this uh, double portion of the Spirit and then ask the question, where is the Lord God of Elijah? Friend, I believe that question ought to be asked right here. It ought to be asked right now because we're living in a corrupt, collapsing culture. Listen to me tonight. Modern so-called Christianity is sinking in the throes of apostasy. Our own denomination tonight that once stood for revival, evangelism, and soul winning has sold her soul to a modernistic social gospel that is bloodless in every way 
and does not have the power to save anyone. We are sinking tonight in the pursuit of worldly scholarship, in worldly attainment, and worldly recognition. And as a result, vital spiritual Christianity, as we have known it, has become a thing of the past. Oh, the prayer altars are forsaken. Strong Bible preaching is forgotten. Fervent evangelism is non-existent in our day and time. And as a result, there's a barrenness that has settled down on the people of God like I've never seen in my life. Oh, I've never seen more people who can come as they are and leave like they are, not affected in any way by the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are typifying tonight the Laodicean age when it says, oh, we have need of nothing. Yet the Bible says, Jesus speaking, oh, yes, you're blind and naked and have much need of many things. I would say tonight as we think about this, what do we need? What do we need? What do we need? Oh, we need to confront the compromising culture with this question. Where is the Lord God of Elijah? Oh, Elijah the Tishbite. He was the Melchizedek of the prophets. He had no beginning and no end, no record of mother nor father. He was, listen, he was the prophet of the Most High God. He was literally shock treatment and an exclamation point in the day and time in which he lived. The Bible says in 1 Kings 16 and verse 33 that wicked Ahab was the most wicked king the world had ever known before then and since then. He goes to him in 1 Kings 17 and verse 1 and says it will not rain except at my voice. Now you think that's important. It certainly is because James the writer says in James 5 17 that Elijah was a man of like passion. That just means this. He's like me and you. But the Bible says he possessed something special in the fact that when he spoke it did not rain until he spoke again. That is the evidence and the mark of the power of God. So we understand tonight he was a man who was the prophet of the most high God. He was a man, listen, who understood the times and what they looked like, but more than that, what they meant. Listen to me tonight. The prophet was the man in the town who oftentimes knew more than everybody else. Say amen right there. The prophet was the man who knew what was happening where no one else did. And the Bible says Elijah was that man. Well, I believe we need that again tonight. Christianity is fastly becoming a nonprofit organization. Say amen right there. You understand tonight, America is godless. The church is powerless. Christians are careless. Yet, listen, God chose to raise up a man in that moment in time. You say, oh, what kind of man was he? He was a man of the mountain. The Bible says he dwelled in a place called Gilead. That's the mountain country. Isn't it amazing? As he dwelled in the mountains, when you fast forward this picture to Matthew chapter 17, the Bible says at the Mount of Transfiguration, who would Peter, James, and John see? but Moses and Elijah standing there with you. Oh, he was a man of the mountain. When Jesus needed to recall somebody to that moment to say this is what it looks like, this is what it should be. Oh, he brought old Elijah the Tishbite. He was a man of the mountain. He was a man who lived by faith. He was a man who walked in a peculiar manner because of the mantle that he possessed. I think about Elijah. Listen to this. He did seven miracles and Elisha did four because Elisha possessed a double portion. So here now Elijah has brought the mantle to Elisha. Can you all imagine that church? What must that mantle have looked like? It must have been ragged and torn. It wasn't a garment to cover you. It wasn't something to be just an adorning piece of clothing. Oh no, it was the mark of the man of God. It was the mark of the man who possessed the word of Almighty God. And I'm looking tonight across this land in which we live and as we are becoming... Listen, more and more, listen, we are becoming more and more godless in our way. Here's what I believe about this. I believe there's going to come a day when men and women are going to beg for a man just to stand up and read God's word once again. That's where we are in the land tonight. But understand this. He can do something in this moment that's never been done before. He can do something in this church that's never been done before. He can do something that will cause the world to stand on the end. He can 
do something that will make everyone turn, look, listen, and say but one thing. That's God and God alone who did that. So you understand tonight, this comes as we think about the man Elijah. We must cry like the prophet of old. Oh, where is he? You may stand alone, but friend, listen. You, listen, you'll never stand by yourself because he's always standing by the one who stands by the word of God. Say amen. I want you to look with me tonight. If there's a scene on the stage of Scripture that gives us a look into our culture, it is found right here in 1st and 2nd Kings. There was a political culture that was corrupt, a people in full-blown compromise, and one preacher who stood against it all. One preacher who stood and said, literally, thus saith the Lord. Turn in your Bible with me over to 1st Kings chapter 18 as we think about the question now. We think about the question, but watch this. We get the answer right here in our midst. As we think about this question, where is the Lord God of Elijah? I'll just submit this to this culture. What does that look like? What does the Lord God of Elijah look like in the midst of the culture in which you are living? Well, I think it's found right here in 1 Kings chapter number 18. I want you to note several things with me tonight as we walk through this chapter together. Are you all with me? Say amen. amen. All right, I want you to note number one. Now, listen to me carefully. This is serious business. The matter of revival is serious business. And it ought to be brought back to serious business in the mind hearts of God's people. Because without revival, we don't survive. Without revival and without a touch of God on us, we're never going to see the greatness of God on us again. And I just believe this. He's not a respecter of persons. He's not a respecter of time. He'll do right now what he did right here if we'll just call on his name. Notice what the Bible tells us about this culture that cried out this very important question. Notice number one, it was a culture of people who were wavering. It was a culture of people who were wavering. Notice now what the Word of God says in verse number 17. And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah that Ahab said unto him, Watch this, art thou he that troubleth Israel? Has everybody got the background to that? Here comes the wicked king Ahab. No doubt his wicked wife Jezebel was with him. They were a wicked pair. The most wicked pair the world of that day had ever known. And he walks up and he sees the man Elijah. And here's the first thing he says to him. Well, there's the old troubler of Israel. There's the man who has brought all of the problems upon us. You ever Listen, does that sound familiar in the culture in which you live tonight? Does that sound familiar on the news reel in the morning, who gets blamed for all the problems? The Christian. You just let the Christian do something, stand up. They'll be the one who's blamed for the issue. That's nothing new, church. That's been going on throughout all the age of time. The Bible says, are you that that troubles, troubleth Israel? Notice verse 18. And he answered, watch this. I have not troubled Israel. Now you understand, to say that Elijah was living in a culture of carnality is an understatement. To say that he was living in a culture of capitulation and compromise is an understatement. He was living in one of the most wicked times the world had ever known. But understand then, the culture then is like the culture now. They were deceived. The culture then, like the culture tonight, is deceived. You are living in a culture that is deceived of the enemy. You are living in a culture, again, as I stated a moment ago, that is debating issues the Word of God has already settled. A baby is a baby from the time of conception. Say amen. That's clear in the Word of God. The Bible says in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 28, choose life. We understand in Jeremiah 1.5, I knew you, I formed you in the womb. The Bible says very clearly the matter is settled. So we're debating in the halls of government something the Word of God has already settled. Why? Because we're deceived. That's why. Now the debate is this. Who marries who? Is it a man and a man or a woman and a woman? A man and a woman. The Word of God's already settled that. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24, the Bible the Bible says, a man, listen, a man will leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So we understand the word of God, yet again, has already settled a matter that the culture is fiercely debating. We are debating it because we are a deceived people. We have been deceived by the lie of the enemy. We have been deceived by the lie of the devil. And as a result, we are just wandering around just like these people in the scripture before us. You say, what happened? to them preacher well the thing that happens to any culture they first and foremost forsook the word of God 
They just rejected God's word. Notice verse 18, if you will, in your text. The Bible says, he says, I've not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house. Here's why right here. Notice verse 18. The Bible says, in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord. Does everybody see that? Say amen. amen. What that means in our vernacular tonight, our language is simple. It means this. They just shut the book and they rejected it. They said, I'll now live as I see fit. That's what happened in the judges. The Bible says there was no king in Israel, and they did that which was right in their own eyes. You understand? When a man, when a woman, when a culture, when a denomination, when a nation, when a world rejects the word of God, there is only one option, and that is to walk in wonder, in dark blindness, with no light or illumination from anywhere. They were where they were, be, listen, because they rejected the word of Almighty God. Notice what the Bible says again in verse 18. It says, you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord. Notice this, whether we reject it, which means deny it, or whether we neglect it, which means don't follow it. Either way, when we forsake God's word and fail to obey God's word, there are consequences that come with it. Oh, Amos said in Amos chapter 8 and verse 11, he said, oh, there's coming a time of famine, not of bread and water, but of a hearing of the word of God. When the, listen, when the word of God is shut to the people, the people will starve a spiritual death in a famine that cannot be measured by human means nor human terms. They were where they were because they rejected the word of God. We are where we are tonight because we have rejected the word of God. And you know what? We love to slam the halls of Congress but I'd go ahead and submit to you tonight there are many so-called churches across this land that have forsaken the word of God. You can see the result in it. They are dying. They are drying. They are declining because they have failed to put the listen they have failed to put the word of God first and God's word shall always triumph the Bible says thy word is forever settled in heaven O Lord the Bible says in Psalm 18 10 the word is tried and true the Bible says in John 17 17 thy word is true oh God's word shall always triumph and come out as the holy word of almighty God the Bible says they forsook that word. They forsook it in that day. But understand, as a result of forsaking the word, here's the result. Watch this. They lost their way. They lost their way. Look at verse 18. The Bible says, watch this. Now, I want you to notice this carefully, church. They forsook the word of God, and they followed the Baals. You won't stay neutral. I can't stand to hear that. Uh, come out of, I can't decide. To decide, not to decide, is to decide. You're going to make a decision in a moment. You're either going to decide for Christ or you're going to decide against him. But either way, you're not going to stay neutral. Understand, no one stays neutral. The minute, the minute, I'm talking about the minute you reject truth, you will in turn embrace a lie. The minute you reject truth, there is a vacuum inside of you that desires to be filled and you will do everything you can to fill it with the things of the world, the flesh, and the devil. The Bible says they had no sooner forsook the word of God that they were following after the most ungodly, perverted, pagan idols the world has ever known. That's what happens when people reject the word of God. It was a culture that was wavering. It was a people who were wavering. Understand this. Here are the people now of God bowing down to idols and pagan gods. I just put in my notes, they were in a mess. That's, that's the bottom line. They were in a mess. And understand tonight, and I want to go ahead and settle this, because I can't wait till Thursday night. Here we go. Our problem tonight is not political. Our problem is not social. Our problem is not economic. Our problem is not relational. Our problem is spiritual tonight. We have a spiritual crisis in America, and it is because we have rejected the inspired, infallible, inerrant, perfect word of Almighty God. The Bible says they were wavering because they forgot the word of God. But let me show you secondly... Not only was there a culture of people who were wavering, notice what the Bible tells us. It was there, listen, there was a conviction that God is able. Now, this is where, hey, hey, watch this. The tide's about to turn. Say amen right there. Hey, there's a conviction now that's risen up that says, oh, God's able. Our God can do what no other power can do. Notice now 
what happens in verse number 19. The scripture says, Now therefore send together to me all Israel to the Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets of the grove, 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. And Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel, verse 20, and they gathered them together unto Mount Carmel. Now notice verse 21. Look what happens. The Bible says, Here now, watch this. I love this part. It's my favorite part of the message. Hey, this is the conviction of the man of God. I believe the man of God ought to have a backbone. I believe you ought to have conviction. You ought to believe something. And you say, well, where's a good picture of that? Right here. Here is a preacher now standing against 850 pagan prophets. Now, have you noticed this? Now, notice what happens right here. Look what the scripture says in verse number 21. It says, Elijah came to all the people and said, How long halt you between two opinions? How long are you going to, ha- listen, how long are you going to waver between, e- let, let your yes be yes or your no be no? And then notice what he says now. If the Lord be God, follow him. And if Baal, then follow him. He laid it out there now. I love it. That's good preaching. He said, this is what he says. Listen, and watch what happens now. This is amazing. This had to be a Baptist congregation he was talking to. (laughs) They answered him not a word. Can I submit something to you tonight, church? I love you. And there's no place I'd rather be standing right behind this sacred desk where the man of God stands week in and week out. But there is nothing in this world more cowardly than a Christian out of fellowship with God. Nothing. I repeat, nothing. There is nothing more cowardly that makes God sick than a Christian out of fellowship who will not say anything. They'll sit quiet while they know what's going on is right or wrong. And look what happens. Oh, Elijah said, if God, listen, if God's God, follow him. Baal's Baal, follow him. And they just didn't say a word. Now, watch, I want you to, here's what I want you to do. I want you to put a mental note right there because that's about to change too. Notice what happens. That conviction of the man of God. Notice what he says. Call on who you will, but I'm calling on the Lord God. Look at verse 24. He said, you call on the name of your gods, and he said, I'll call on the name of the Lord God. Oh, say amen. Amen. He said, you call on who you want, but I'm going to call on the name of the Lord, the living Lord God of heaven. And the Bible says, he says, I'll call on the name of the Lord and the God that answers by fire, you let him be God. He says, the one that shows up in the midst of the storm, you let him be God. The one that shows up in the midst of the trial, you let him be God. The one that shows up in the midst of the crisis when your home's falling apart and your mind won't work and your heart's breaking like never before, you let that God who answers be the God of life, liberty, and health heaven and his name is Jesus Christ the Bible says he says you let him be God that's the conviction but then notice what happens note not only the conviction of the man of God note the contest with now the enemies of God look what the scripture says now in verse 23 it says or look at verse 22 it says then I Elijah under the then said Elijah unto the people I even I remain the only prophet of the Lord now y'all ever thought about that phrase right there does everybody remember what happens in, in 1 Kings 19? In verse, there's 7,000 who haven't bowed the knee. <laughs> we need to have a message on that. Where in the world are they? There's 7,000 who haven't bowed the knee to bit. Where are they? That means wh- where's the troops? Where's the church while the man was standing by himself? Church, you've got to stand behind the man of God. <laughs> God's people got to stand behind God's man. When God's man's wearing the mantle of God, God's people got to be there. Here's why. Because he's going, listen, he's triumphing for truth and for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And now Elijah says, oh, it's I, only I that remain. I'm the last one standing right here. And then notice what he says in verse 25. And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, now watch this. Choose you unto the, listen, choose unto the prophets of Baal one bullock for yourself and dress it. For you are many and call on the name of your gods. You notice that? He said, you call on the name of your gods, but watch this. Don't put any fire under it. Now watch that. Don't miss that. Don't put any fire under it. And then he says this, and you call on the name of your gods and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God that answers by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, well, it's well spoken. They said, that's good. That'll work. Then notice what he says now in verse 26. And they took the bullet which was given them and they dressed it and called on the name of Baal from morning even until noon. Now watch what happens right here. I want you to see this. The first thing that happens is the show. A lot of what goes on is a show. Amen. Amen. Oh, that was good right there. Come on. Amen. 
That's worth coming to revival for right there. A lot of what goes on is a show. And God ain't within a million miles of it. It's a show. It's exactly what happened right here. They got that book and they put it on the altar and here's what they did. They began to call on Baal from morning until noon. Now notice what happens in the show. Look what it says now in verse 25. It says, or verse 26, it says, it says, Old Baal, hear us. Now watch this. Now I want you to underline this in your Bible. This will settle any, you don't need Robbie Zacharias to tell you this. There's only one true God. There's only one way to God. His name is Jesus Christ. He's not a good way. He's not the best way. He is the only way. There is one way to God because there is one God. There's not millions of gods. Don't let the Buddhists and the Sikhs and the Hindus and all the Eastern religions of mysticism tell you that you just make your way to God however you want. There's people under the sound of my voice believe that. Well, I preacher, I'm just going to go this way. I'm going to go that way. No, no, you're going to go God's way if you're going. Because God's way is the only way. So understand, when they begin to cry out to the gods here, the gods there, listen, understand this. Notice what the answer is. And it's settled right here in Scripture. But there was no voice nor any that answered. Listen, nobody answered because nobody was there. <laughs> Amen. Hey, just when you get backed against the wall... By an atheist whose mouth's bigger than his brain, understand this. There's only one true God in his name. Listen, it's Jehovah God. There's only one God. The Bible says when they begin to speak, look what happens. They leaped on the altar which was made. And it came to pass. Notice this. All this went on. And watch this. This always amazed me. The show, then the silence. The silence. You guys listen to me tonight. How many people within just an earshot of this building are crying out to gods of wood and stone to answer them in their problem and in their hurt and in their brokenness, but there's no voice that answers? There's no voice that answers. How much more should we be, listen, taking the answer to them? Amen. So understand, that show led to silence. But then this is why Elijah is probably one of my favorite Bible characters. Note the sarcasm. Everybody laugh, because it's funny. Look what he says. And it came to pass at noon, verse 27, watch these three words, Elijah mocked them. Hmm. <laughs> Look what he did. He says this, cry aloud, for he is a God. Notice what he says. Either he is talking, maybe he's, maybe he's tied up. Then he says this, or he is pursuing. That means maybe he's in the restroom. That's what that means in the Hebrew language. I'm not kidding you. That's, that's the truth. You go look for yourself. Maybe he's, maybe he's indisposed. That's what that means. So maybe he's talking. Maybe he's had to take a break of his own. Or it says this, maybe he's in a journey. Look at this. Or peradventure, watch this, he's asleep and needs to be wakened. Can I say something to you tonight? We serve the one who is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. We serve the one, he's the God of Israel who neither slumbers nor sleeps. We hear the, listen, we serve the one tonight that is right here in this meeting with us. We invited him in here just a moment. He's enjoying revival right here because he, listen, there's never a time when he doesn't hear. There's never a time when he's not in tune. There's never a time when he does not understand the needs, listen, the needs of his people. He is the living and true God. Oh, Elijah just said, well, maybe he's tied up. Not a word. Look what happens. Notice verse 27. It says, or maybe he must be awakened. Then notice verse 28. They cried aloud and cut themselves after the manner, listen, with knives and lances. Look at this. Y'all notice this till the blood gushed out. Can I say something to you tonight? A man's blood can't save you. Only the blood of the Lamb of God without spot and blemish. <laughs> You can cut, you can do, but God doesn't answer that. Now listen carefully. So there's the sarcasm, but then let me show you. This is my favorite part. There's the show, the silence, and the sarcasm, but note the setting up for the supernatural. Look at verse 30. Now here's what happens. Now watch this. The Bible says in verse 29, they prophesied till the time of the offering and the evening sacrifice, and there was neither voice nor any to answer them nor any that regard. And I notice verse 30. Now I want you all to pay careful attention. I'm done. Just a minute. Look what he says. Elijah said unto all the people, now watch this, come near unto me. 
come near unto me. Come close. Come close. And he says, and all the people came near, near unto him. And I want you all to note this last phrase right here. I want you to underline it in your Bible. He repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. You know what that word in the Hebrew for repaired is? Rapha. He brought healing. He healed the altar. If we're ever going to see anything happen, we need to repair the altar that's been broken down. The Bible says when he repaired the altar, notice what happens. The scripture says it was broken down. And then look at verse 31. Elijah took 12. Did y'all get that right there? I don't think you did. I want to hear you say amen to that. <laughs> Jehovah Rapha is the God who heals. Say amen. amen. That word repaired is the word Rapha. That means healing. That means that he restored, he touched the altar with a healing touch because that's exactly what had to happen if God was going to show up and answer in that moment. Oh, amen. Notice what he says now. The Bible says in verse 31, And Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. Why are they 12 stones? Because that is the print. Watch this. That is the principle of unity. You cannot have revival without unity. You cannot have revival till things are set in order. And the Bible says Elijah set the stones in order. And the scripture says with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench. Now watch this. About the altar as great as would contain two measures of seed. Now you'll understand two measures of seed. That's not five gallon buckets. Y'all got that? These are huge barrels. And the Bible says, and he put the wood in order and cut the bullock in pieces and laid him on the wood. And watch this. He said, fill four barrels with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. And then notice what he says. Do it a second time. He says, do it a second time. And then he said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. Now look, watch this. They have just taken giant barrels of water and now poured on a burnt sacrifice. Amen. You're going to get this in a minute. Yeah. You're going to come on with me, and it's going to be good when we get to the end. Now, everybody's going to kind of arrive at the same spot at the same time. You say, well, bless God, preacher. Why is that so important? Well, you understand they were in a three-and-a-half-year drought. They brought the most precious thing they had. There'll never be revival until you bring the most precious thing you have to the altar. They brought the one commodity that was the very source of life in a time where there had been nothing but death. And now the man of God has put the altar back together that was broken down by pagan apostates and now he has set it in order and he has told them to bring the most precious item that they had in the midst of a drought. They brought the water and he said, don't just pour one bucket out and leave some for yourself. He said, pour every bit of it out until the entire altar is drenched with water and soaked in the trench in a flood. And what you see now is Elijah has set up the supernatural for God to answer him in that moment. And the Bible says now, as he poured that water out, oh, I just got to say that one more time. We won't have a revival until we bring the most precious thing we have to the altar of God and leave it and say, wherever you lead, I go, I'll go. I surrender all. Whatever it is you want from me, that's what I want from you. And then, only then, can we see the revival fire of heaven fall. you got to bring the most precious thing you have. Let me ask you a question tonight. What's standing between you and revival? What's standing between you and revival pouring out? What's standing? What's, ha what's happening right now? I'm not talking about where your wife can see your kids. Can. I'm talking about inside of you. In the place where nobody knows but you and God. What's standing in the way of revival coming? What are you holding on to? It, is it a precious commodity? Is it a precious thing? Is it a precious sin? What are you holding on to tonight that would cause God not to answer you in the way of revival? Friend, I'm telling you tonight, until we just get blatantly honest with God and lay out before him everything in our life and say, God, we want, we want you to meet us right here. And I'm bringing the most precious thing I have. I'm laying it before the altar. 
You say, preacher, is that biblical? God sent the most precious thing he had, and that's his son, that you and I can be saved. I'd say, oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. We must do just as they did. The Bible says he set up the supernatural. So here's what happens. So the contest with the enemy is God. Now there's the calling on the living God. Look at verse 36. He said, and the Bible says, and it came to pass at the time of the offering and the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near. Now watch what he does. And he said, Lord God of Abraham. You ever thought about this scene right here? If you've ever been there or you've ever seen it in a picture, you ought to Google it when you get home, Mount Carmel. You ought to understand that it's, a, it's placed in such a manner that when this event was going on, everybody in the city could see what was happening. I'm about to shout. Everybody in the city could see what was happening. When God shows up, that's exactly the way it'll be. It'll be done in a manner where everybody knows, everybody sees, and everybody understands only God could have done that. The Bible says that amphitheater of glory began to be set up. And now as Elijah cried out, listen to what he says. He said, oh, Abraham, God of Abraham and Isaac, and of Israel. You ever thought about that Israel right there? Notice why in verse number uh, in verse number 32, when he says, call on the name of the Lord, he said, of the Lord of Jacob. Understand this. He now calls him Israel. Anybody ever, everybody ever notice that? Can I, y'all got a minute? I'll share it with you. Where, where, hey, go back to the 32nd chapter of the book of Genesis. And, and Jacob, man, he went to pray. There he crossed over that river. And here's what he said when he crossed. He said, I came across this river one time. I didn't have nothing. I didn't have a thing. I had nothing but my wicked brother chasing me. That's all I had. And he said, but I've come back across it this time, and I've got herds, I've got men, I've got money, I've got all these things that the grace of God has provided. And now he's there at Jabbok. He's there at Penuel, the face of God. And he's crying out to God. And he says, listen, I'm not going to let go until you answer. And there he wrestled all night. There the great contest took place. And then God spoke. You remember how he spoke? Come on, you know the story. He knocked his hip out of joint. You, you say, preacher, why is that important? I'll tell you why. Because he knocked his hip out of joint that he'd walk a different way. <laughs> he'd walk a different way. I'm just going to put this in there tonight. How many, are you walking a different way? Or are you just walking the same old way? More people say they're saved with their mouth and their feet give no evidence to it. I'm going to tell you, when Jacob came back, he came back different than the way he left. I can just imagine his kids, preacher. His, they all saw him, the man leave. They said, there goes our daddy, the old, trick, the old trickster, <laughs> the old deceiver, the old sleight of hand man, the one who's the con artist. That's what Jacob was. He said, well, there he went. I wonder where he's going. Well, he didn't know he was going out to meet with the living God. The Bible says he went out from them. I mean, no doubt in my mind, he, they watched him go. But then one day, y'all follow me? They saw a man come back. And they said, well, there comes a man, but that's not our daddy. Because our daddy doesn't walk like that. And then as he drew, hey, daddies, how do you walk? How are you walking before your children tonight? Because understand this, the church may not know it, the community may not know it, the coach may not know it, but the kids know it. And when they saw him come back, here's what they saw. They saw this old man limping. And as he got closer, <laughs> they said, that's our daddy. But he's been changed. He's not walking back like he walked out. <laughs> Something's happened to him. That's what happens when Jesus comes. You say, why is that important in this story? Because Elijah called on the God who changes lives. Well, that's good. Aren't we having fun? We got till Thursday night to do this. Isn't it amazing? <laughs> We're just getting started good. I'm just getting warmed up. I want to call on tonight the God who changes lives. I want to call him the, the God that makes a difference. He puts an imprint on you that never changes. Listen, it never changes after it changes you. That's good. That's who Elijah called on. You say, well, does that matter? Well, let's just see the remainder of the story. We're done right here. 
Christmas miracle. Isn't it amazing? Amen. Look what he says. He says, he says, I'm calling on the God of Israel. And I just put in my Bible, you may not write in yours, but I love to write in mine. I just put the God who changes lives right there in my margin. I said, that's who he called on. He called on the one who could answer not only by fire, but he could answer by a changed life. And the Bible says right here, it says, he says, I am the servant and I've done all these things at thy word. Now that's very important. You need to note that in your Bible. He didn't do it at the word of the denomination. He didn't do it at the word of the church. He did it at the word of the Lord. And the Bible says, hear me, O Lord, verse 37, that this people, now notice his, notice his cry, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God and that thou hast turned their heart back again. So here now is the crux of the matter. He says, I'm calling on the God who can turn the hearts of the children back to him. I'm calling on the God tonight who can turn the heart of a nation back to him. I'm calling on the one tonight as a lowly, weak, unworthy, unfit, listen, untrained, un-everything servant, but I understand this. I'm calling on the one who has the answer, and his name is Jesus. The Bible says he called on him in that way, and he says, turn their heart back Again, he called on the God who could do something. He called on the living God. So there's the conviction that God, hey, listen to me tonight. Y'all believe God's able. Y'all believe God can. You know, the children of Israel said in Psalm 78, 10, can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Oh, God can. God can. He's able tonight to do. We're living in such a defeated, depressed, give up age. You need to understand he's not out of the fire falling business. That's what you need to understand. And the Bible says just in that moment, watch this, the consuming fire of God fell. Look what it says now in verse number 38. <laughs> then the fire of the Lord fell. Then the fire of the Lord fell. I've been a Baptist preacher almost 20 years now. And I know I don't look like you said you couldn't have been in it more than 20, 20 months. There's no way. You look like you're only like 25 years old. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm almost 50 years old. And I've been doing this almost 20 years. And here's what I know. If the fire of God fell in the majority of churches, we wouldn't know what to do. Because we didn't come expecting it. You say, how do you know that? Because there was a whole crowd around him didn't expect it. And they were the people who were supposedly naming the name of God himself. And here's one man. And then notice verse 38. Right here, look what it says. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice. Watch this. Y'all making a note here? And the wood. Now watch. what We just said the wood done been drenched, right? Right? Any idiot knows wet wood won't burn. Everybody knows that. There, listen. Man don't have enough matches to strike, to, listen, to strike wet wood. I'm just going to tell you that. You can bring all the matches you want to that event. Nothing's going to happen. Amen. Yeah, I, I can tell you that. I don't know a lot, but I know that. You can't make that happen. Nope. So notice what happens. It consumed the wood. Then notice the next thing. And the stones. And the dust. Isn't that amazing? And he licked up the water that was in the trench. <laughs> you know what we say in our culture, don't you? He left no doubt. He left no doubt who showed up. That's the way I want it to be every time I come to the house of God. I want it to be left no doubt who just met us and who just did for us. You know, I'm looking across this room right now, and I was noticing when I, at the people that got saved in here. Just I watched it happen. I stood right here behind this desk. You stood right there. We watched people come down the aisle and give their heart to Jesus Christ. You know what that was? That was leaving no doubt. Leaving no doubt. The Bible says, watch this. It licked up everything that was in the trench. So here's what we know. It was an immediate fire. It was an indisputable fire. It was an impossible fire. It was impossible. But then notice what happens. This is my favorite part. Here's, what, here's where we're going to start right here. We're just getting started. Then there was the clear evidence of revival. You say, what does the clear evidence of revival look like right here in the Word of God? Notice what he says. Verse 39, y'all watching this? Say amen if you're listening. Amen. And when the, all the people saw it, they fell on their faces. 
And here, now here it is. Are y'all watching this? This is where I've been waiting to get to. The only person in this room knows what I'm about to say is my wife. Because she's heard this about a hundred times. So the same group of people who answered him not a word is this group of people who now said. They opened their mouth. God got a hold of their heart. And look what happens. They fell on their face and they said, The Lord, He is God. (laughs) That excites me. Because there's never a day that's so dark that He can't shine through it. (laughs) There's never a sin so black that He can't wash it white as snow. There's never a circumstance that is so messed up that he can't right that circumstance because he is the God who answers by fire. And when he answered them by fire, preacher, here's what they said. The Lord, he is God. Now just imagine this, boys, a minute ago, it's how long halt you between two opinions. Won't you just open your mouth? They didn't say a word. I'm not saying anything. Bless God, the committee hadn't met. I'm not doing anything. I am going to say anything. <laughs> well, our business meeting is not for another month now. I'm not going to open my mouth. This is not Robert's Rules of Order. I'm not saying a word. But now, the fire of heaven has fallen. Something supernatural has happened. And all the people said, Oh, the Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. That's the God who answers by fire. They said it. Three times, he is the God. So you say, preacher, what happened? Well, the fire fell from heaven. You know what a fire is? The fire is the judgment of God. Say amen. Amen. That's the purge. That's the purge that took place. But then notice what happens. Just as the fire fell from heaven, everybody knows that's revival, right? Isn't that revival? Oh, yes. Let the fire of God fall on us once again. That's revival. But then notice what else happened. No sooner had the fire fallen from heaven (laughs) that the flood came from heaven. Look at verse 41. The Bible says, And Elijah said unto Ahab, Get thee up and eat and drink. Y'all watching this. For there is the sound of the abundance of rain. Fire represents the judgment of God. Rain represents the revival of God. Lord, let the fire fall that the rain may come. Let the fire fall that the rain may come. Let the fire fall that the abundance of rain would flood into this place. Boy, isn't that what you want? Say, how does it happen when you meet God's requirement? So I've just come tonight to say this. Where is the Lord God of Elijah? I've just shown you who the Lord God of Elijah is. I've not only shown you who he is, I've shown you what he can do. I've shown you what he's capable of. I've shown you what he wants to do. I've shown you how he can do it. I've shown you what he'll do when he does it. And I just believe right now here in Walkerville Church, we ought to just start crying out, where's the Lord God of Elijah? Where's the Lord God of Elijah? Do do right now what you did right there. Do in this moment what you did in that moment. That we may see you fall in your power come once again. The same God who answers by fires, the same God who provides the rain. Where is the Lord God of Elijah? Is that what you want tonight? I'm just going to backdrop this for you and give an invitation right here to God's people tonight. You know, I just think about revival and I think about the days of revival. You know, there's a whole generation of children sitting in this room outside of this revival meeting that we saw right here. They've never seen a real revival of God. They've never seen what Charles Finney saw. They've never seen what Dwight L. Moody saw in England in almost 16 weeks of preaching across that continent, and the whole continent was shaken for Christ. We've not seen him. I think about my dad tonight who's in heaven, who traveled with an evangelist named Jess Henley. Dr. Jess, get this, he wouldn't go to a revival unless the preacher agreed to go three weeks. He wouldn't even take the meeting. That scared half y'all to death. He said, look, he said, look here. He said, I didn't, and he'd always say, he said, I understand, understand. The old boy shot out from preaching over the years. He said, that doesn't mean they're going to go, but the man must be willing. He said, if there's not a willingness, there'll never be a revival. And he wouldn't go, but let's say, say three weeks. He'd only take about 10 meetings a year. 
I mean, I can remember my daddy getting on an airplane at Peachtree to Cab Airport with them and flying off to some state, and they'd be gone three weeks. We wouldn't know when he was coming back. Because revival doesn't operate by a clock or a calendar, a bylaw or a timesheet. It operates on the sovereign hand of Almighty God. And when we meet that requirement, and that's what Elijah did, he met the requirement of God. I would say tonight we need to meet the requirement of God. I think about those meetings, Greg. My daddy said he did a meeting with him, one, one three-week meeting. He didn't even give an Watch this. This will blow your mind. He didn't even give an invitation for nine nights. Just preached to the Christians. But he said on about that ninth night, the power of God fell. And almost a thousand people were won to Christ in the next two weeks. That's what happens when real revival comes. It's not just a meeting. It's not just an emotional experience where people just kind of get charged up and then go away. Understand this. We must come back to where is the Lord God of Elijah. Because without him, we're dead in the water. We have no hope. And we have no promise of anything happening apart from the touch of God being on us. Folks, that's what I'm crying out for. I've been crying out for that in Hazelhurst. Man, I've been crying out for that everywhere I go. I couldn't wait here to get here tonight to cry out just one more time. Oh, God, meet us. God, do it again. God, set down in this place. I want to look across this room and even tomorrow night. You're even, right now, you're burdened over people's souls. And you're saying it's only the power of God that can change this life. That's where you need to be, right there. And say, oh God, I'm setting the impossible before you. Begin to do it right here in our midst. Where is the Lord God of Elijah? Where is the Lord God of Elijah? Father, in the name of Jesus, meet us right here. Lord, let us, let us just put, let's push the pause button, Lord, right now and say, God, meet us right here. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're in this room tonight, whether you're in the front or the very back, 